We're going to talk, talk about improving test strategies, attitudes, attitudes and strategies, because attitudes about tests sometimes can, can really affect our performance, can't they? Um, so we'll talk about that too, and it all really, you can't separate it. So here we go. We're going to take a test, a true-false test, about test anxiety. You ready? Does that make you nervous? It's not graded, so you don't have to worry. If there's any part of an answer to this little quiz that you agree with, after I read it, even a part of a question, because I'll stop to give you a chance to kind of process it, raise your hand up. That will be voting, yeah, true. That is true. Okay, would you help me with that? So, the following are signs of test anxiety. Mental blank outs. True? No. Yeah. How about racing thoughts? True? Okay. How about negative thoughts about past performance? Yeah. Uh, consequences of failure or how everyone else is doing? Anybody ever that? Yeah? Okay. Knowing the answers, but after, not while you're taking the test. Anybody? Don't you hate that? You leave the test, and that's when you remember the answer. I knew that. How about true or false? Raising your hand would be true. Getting a good night's sleep the night before the test can cure or take care of test anxiety. True or false? You're smart not to raise your hand. <laughs> What's false about that? <laughs> it doesn't matter how much sleep you got. So you, you slept really well like a baby, but you're not prepared for the test. You're still not going to pass it. You have that great breakfast that, you know, everybody tells you to get, and you didn't prepare for the test, you're still probably not going to do well. Okay, that's a false. How about your stress may negatively affect your test performance if you experience nausea, headache, increased heart rate, or dry mouth? True or false? What do you think? Yeah? Okay. So if you feel those things, if I've got a really bad headache because I'm so worried about this test, then I could be... I, it could really affect my performance, couldn't it? Dry mouth, I just can't, you know, I need a drink of something, but I'm just like, can't talk, can't think. Nausea and so forth. And some people don't experience all of those things, but one of those things could really perfect your performance. How about test anxiety is always a bad thing? Yes? No? You're kind of like halfway, okay? Why would you say that that is false? You said sometimes. What were you thinking? Okay, great answer. Absolutely. There's what they call facilitative anxiety and debilitating anxiety. Have you heard the difference in those two? Facilitating anxiety is what was just described very well, and that is we need some anxiety. Like performers, have you ever felt like just really nervous before you like did a performance or sports or music or a test? And you felt good, it helped you do your best job um, on that test or in that performance. But that's the facilitating. It facilitates or helps you perform well when you have a little bit of nervousness. Someone called Madeline Hunter that is part of um, the pers a person who taught teachers a lot about good teaching said, you need mild anxiety. That's a really good thing, okay? Debilitating anxiety is what just cripples you. It's that that causes the heart rate to increase so far fast that you just can't even concentrate or the headache, or the dry mouth, or you're so worried about negative thoughts, I'm not going to pass, not going to pass. Those are the things that are debilitating, and that's when it is a bad thing. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is making sure that we think about being, having good, facilitative anxiety, not the debilitating, crushing, I can't think of the answer, I'm not going to do well kind. Okay? What about this one? You will need a clearly targeted study plan for the weeks leading up to the test. True or false? Let me see your hands or no? Yeah. There is no substitute, right, for just being well prepared. So we're going to look at some ways to be well prepared and making sure that you bring your best self, your best preparation to the study um, situation. So let's take a look. What I want to do, and you have a handout, and please feel free beside each of these slides to take some extra notes if you want to, if that's helpful. Um, there, is, there are causes to test anxiety. It is normal, 
everybody throughout their lives feels some of it. We test in different ways. Those of us who have doctorates still feel like we're testing. When we talk to our employer about our performance, we might go back and get another degree. You know, everybody who is building this educational repertoire is going to feel test anxiety. It's very normal. One cause is you're unfamiliar with the test. What you want to think about is learning about the test and just saying, Professor, I, may I ask some questions? If you're not provided that information, uh, that would be helpful to ask about. Is it multi how many multiple choice might there be? You may not get real specific answers. Sometimes you will. Is there true false? Are there short answer? Okay, are constructed completion questions? Is there an essay or are there essay questions? That's going to help you to know how to prepare. And sometimes you'll know how the point value for those items. And you'll also know, maybe be given a study guide to help you prepare that as well. So you'd ask some questions uh, to yourself, to your colleagues, your classmates, and to your professor. Um, what format does it use? And here are some of those. Constructive response, short answer. True, false, essay. You may have one, you may have more. Makes a difference, doesn't it? So you're kind of, before you even get in there, you're plotting out what might be the way you allot your time to take the test and not feel so nervous. What topics are covered and how much time do I have? One of the common questions is, will we have class after the test? You ever thought about that and asked that? You know, it's, if I have a two-hour chunk for this co a course normally, are we going to have an hour, you know, some of the time for the test and then I've got to finish before we have some more class time? Or can I devote the whole class time to the test? It can make a big difference, can it? Um, and that's not, that's not a, a question that would be uh, unreasonable. All right, another would be um, you feel you haven't mastered the subject being tested. Sometimes you kind of have. You just feel like, yeah, I, I really, I know it's on the test. I know it's important. It's been brought out by the professor. And I've, I know that, that what uh, sections in the book to cover, whatever materials I've been given. But there's no replacement for making an organized study plan. How many of you do that now? If you kind of write down what you're going to do, like in a, on a calendar, day timer, you might consider doing that. Especially the bigger the test, the higher the stakes, the more points, like finals and midterms, it would really be a good idea. We call it chunking. When you take a project or a test preparation uh, um, uh, schedule and you break it up into, and you put it down in little chunks. This weekend I'm going to do this much. Next weekend I'm going to make sure I've gotten this done. And just rather than wait till everything gets done the night before, and you really feel like you're not going to have enough time. What's that called? You do all the studying the night before. Cramming. <laughs> Never a good idea. Because we know what our brains do with cramming. It jumbles our brains. Have you heard about that? Mm -hmm. It really jumbles our brains. It creates a lot of havoc with all of those competing pieces of information. And it's really difficult the next day for that test to access those kinds of things. It's called schema in our brains, where all those things are stored. And our brain takes time through sleep to put those pieces of the information in the correct spot so we can pull it from our brains. And if it's all jumbled together within the last 24 hours, it's difficult for the brain to have had time to sort it for us. Okay? All right, so let's take a look. Um, in that, you remember that worrying isn't helpful. So part of your study schedule is not including worrying, okay? Um, that just creates that debilitating anxiety that really sabotages your thinking and, and things that you can retrieve about the test. Um, use all the resources available to you. Some people probably um, hurt themselves in test taking because they study alone all the time. All they do is work alone. And they, I can do it, you know, I like, I'm, I like to work by myself. But if you ask the questions of the instructors, and you might work with a buddy, study buddy, you might work with a study group. Anybody ever done that, working in pairs or a group? Really good idea. Because you have a chance to verbalize a lot of the instruction. And that way, you kind of know what you're thinking and what you know about what you're able to talk about or explain. And other people give you their ideas about what things mean and how they're processing, and you go, oh, hadn't thought of it that way. So it's really a good idea to let one of your resources be other people, not just your text, your notes, 
your professor. Learn important concepts, terms and concepts. How many of you are highlighters? Raise your hand. You highlight things. Anybody underline key concepts in your notes? Okay, do you write in the margins of your books? Probably want to think about doing those things. As you are in class and as you are studying by yourself or with other people, it's a really good idea to begin taking notes and draw those things out of your resources, workbooks, texts, whatever you have, and your notes, of course. But a lot of people have embedded in their notes, of course they're in your textbooks, those key terms that are often bolded. And for you to take a highlighter and highlight them, um, of course, highlight them in your notes too would be really helpful because you want to make sure your eyes will go to that underline or that highlight and you want to be sure that you repeatedly look at those and try to remember them. Underlining concepts too, not just key terms. Make a written plan of study and cross things off. A lot of people make a to-do list, especially as the test gets closer. So one thing to check off would be that you've asked the professor about the test. Check. Another thing you might do is to, make, is to have one other person who's going to help you study, review with you. It could be a family member, whomever. And then another might be that you look over your notes and do that highlighting that I mentioned. And if you create flashcards, who has flashcards or note cards with the, yeah, maybe the word on one side, the definition on the other, or the word and the concept and the, and the description, that's helpful too. All right. Another um, type of anxiety would be you have negative thoughts. Anybody going to a test and you just, it, all of a sudden, all these things, I'm going to fail, I'm not going to have enough time, does that worry you? Okay. What we have to do, everybody does that. We really do to different degrees. You want to counter them with positive thoughts, positive reactions. So what you can do, and if you don't write them down, at least acknowledge them in your head, okay? If I go in thinking with a positive counter, all right, don't let them take over like this little, you know, animal on your shoulder just shouting all these um, things to you like you're, you're going to fail, everybody's going to finish before you do, those kind of things. I always do poorly on test. If you walk in thinking that, what might you do instead of doing well? You're probably going to do poorly. That's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. How many have heard of that? Self-fulfilling prophecy? Okay that whatever you think you're going to do, you cause yourself to do because that's what you believe strongly about yourself. So rather than saying I always do poorly on test, I've got a better study plan now than for the test before this one, I'm going to do better this time. It's not like just do better because you did prepare. Remind yourself that you did prepare better than you normally do and you'll, you can do better. If I don't pass this test, that negative thought is I'm a failure. I'm going to fail the class. I can't take it over, and it's, it's a huge part of my grade. Those kinds of thoughts can really sabotage. So you might say something to yourself, I'm going to pass. I really believe I can pass. But if I don't, I'll get feedback on this test, and then I'll do, use that information and do better next time. It's never hopeless. It's never just totally awful, and I can't, you know, this is going to ruin my life. It's never like that, OK? We know something about the brain. Have you heard of fight or flight reflex? Raise your hand, please. Have you heard about it? Yeah, especially nursing students and psychology students. Fight or flight is part of our brain, and, and there's a whole lot of, a lot of terms in there about limbic system and reptilian brain and all that. And it literally does, we do shut down with extreme anxiety. If we're really afraid, I'm going to fail, I'm going to fail, then we literally start working out of a different part of our brain. Because remember those, those, uh, those cavemen, those early people, and they, they tell us they had to run from the, <clears throat> from the dinosaurs, you know, to, to get away from them, and, and they had to worry about being safe. So that fear saved their lives. We still have that part of us that runs from fear, okay? But what happens when we're trying to think of things that we know and be able to share them and prove that we know them, Sometimes those things don't, aren't available to us because we're working out of a different part of our brain, okay? So you don't want to sabotage yourself when, because you're, you're so uptight you can't remember. Has anybody ever had something said to them that made you so upset that you couldn't think of something to say back? 
okay? They embarrassed you or they hurt your feelings or they were rude. And it was like 30 minutes later before, I wish I'd said this. Not that you're going to be real mean or hateful. It's just that I wish I just had a, a comeback. But your brain has to calm down so you're really working in the neocortex part of your brain before you can access that quick um, retort you wish you'd thought of. And one more, the test is going to be have trick questions. You ever think that? I'm just not going to read the question right. We all do. Tests are designed to let me know what I know. Our professors, the professors don't try to trick anybody. We really want to know what you know and what you need to know better so we can give you that feedback. All right, you, uh, a cause can, you believe myths about a test. There's the trick one. If not the first one, there are going to be trick questions. He's going to see if I read the, the book, the chapter. You know, that's really what some of these questions are going to be. Did I read all the captions and all the, all the chapter? You know, it's going to check up on me. N not, not done. The same answer choice never appears more than three times. Has anyone ever thought that there's a pattern to A, B, C, D orders? Some students have told me that they, if I have like two C's in a row in multiple choice, there can't be another C. You know, there just wouldn't be that many, okay? It does not make a difference. And although, as we construct those tests, we're trying to have a variety of letters on multiple choice, we don't have a pattern. That would not be fair. Another, um, the questions are written to test how well you take test, not to test what you actually know. Not true. There's no real benefit for, for teachers, instructors to do that to you. So do you need to know good things, informed ways to take tests? Of course. That's what you're going to learn today in a minute. But still, it's not a gotcha. That doesn't benefit anybody. Myth, tests are designed to have you uh, answer each question really quickly, and you'll really not have time to answer all the questions. We, uh, hopefully, you'd never feel like that you are not going to have enough time. If you come in and you feel prepared, and you uh, plot out your time, that's a really good thing to do. How many questions do I have? We'll talk about that more in a minute. And how much time do I have for these questions? That's really smart to think about that. But to be anxious the whole time, I'm not going to finish. And nobody cares about whether they gave me too big of a test to take during this time. Generally, people finish. That's been my experience. And if they are prepared and they're not sitting long amounts of time thinking and planning for writing, or if it's an essay or whatever, they, they generally finish plenty of, in plenty of time. So it's the knowing the answers, knowing the material that really makes you finish on time, not how much time you're given. OK, the hard questions are worth more points. Again, that's knowing how the test is graded. That would help you there. But within multiple choices, they're usually the same amount of points. And then tests are full of biased questions. Biased would, would mean I'm, a, I'm a, girl, a woman, so this test is going to be written for boys or men to be successful. Okay? Or I was raised in the country, it's going to have questions for people raised in the city. Generally, that's not the case because we're just looking at content. Okay? Here we go. Another would be your body shows signs of anxiety. All right, you take care of your body. Is it important to sleep enough? Sure. And I gave you another benefit besides not just being tired and sleepy during the test. Remember what your brain is doing every single night? Your brain, while you're in REM sleep, rapid eye movement, is actually storing those bits of information you've learned all day in your brain for better retrieval. So we want to make sure that we, we know that there are reasons for that. Eating well, but we laughed about it. Those two things don't make you do well on the test, right, if you don't know the material. Get plenty of sleep to avoid memory loss, lack of concentration. These are important. Look at this. Socializing. You want to have a really healthy social network of, of friends and family. Because if you're all isolated and you just sort of stew in your own isolation and you don't have breaks, you don't have happy times to be with other people that you care about and love and who give you support, you can do it. I've got a test coming up. I know, I know you'll do well. We had a student worker uh, who just told me before I came over, she actually came back, she finished it and then came back and we tag teamed as I left for this presentation. She said, I'm about to go to, to a debate. I've got to do a debate and I, 
she was all dressed up, and she said, you know, I, I think I can do it. I think I'm doing really well. And there were about five professors, almost all at once in chorus, who said, we know you're going to do well. You'll do awesome. And then as she walked out the door, good luck, we're hollering to her. We need people like that in our lives, don't we? So bring those people around you and let them know when you're taking a test, when things are important to you, so they can cheer you on. It's also a distraction. You need to take breaks. You need to get away from it, enjoy yourself, have some fun, and then come back. So shorter periods of study can really be better than long, stressful periods of studying. Another cause, tension uh, builds up and in its, uh, it reinforces itself. Tension sort of snowballs and gets worse. So take a look at this one. And if nothing else, when you come into a test, breathe. Just breathe. I'm not going to do exercises with you. We're, we're going to move forward. But breathing really can help. So just if you breathe through your nose, you're not going to hyperventilate. And just nobody knows you're doing it. Got the test in front of you. You kind of rush to get there. You want to make sure you're prepared. And you just breathe in. And breathe out slowly. Do that a couple of times. And what happens is it sort of shortcuts that tension process. All those negative images or, or things you've been saying to yourself. That rush, rush, rush. Some people think about pleasant situations. They can go to a, in your mind like, oh, man, Christmas was so awesome last year. You know, I was with my family and the gift exchange and, and just seeing my grandmother. Wow, that was so neat. And again, it kind of distracts you and it puts your brain and your heart and your blood pressure and all of that in a pleasant state. So you kind of short circuit that tension. Um, some people think about just a beautiful place. You know, they have that place to sort of go back to and the beach or the woods or whatever is kind of pretty and relaxing to them. Or your home, your bedroom a place that you enjoy. And then other people, when you're not, I mean, this you may not have ever done this, but remember that a lot of tension builds in our bodies when we're stressed. And so just to tighten up, like you're just putting your hands down by your side, nobody knows it, and just tighten up and then loosen. You dissipate that tension that's in your body, OK? Uh, but the easiest thing is just to breathe. All right, another is you allow the test environment to get on your nerves. Is anybody distracted by sniffling, coughing, people coming late to the test, ever felt that way, that bothered you? Um, you can't do anything about that. You can only do something about your reaction to those things. They're going to happen, OK? Somebody might be talking, they spill, they drop their pencil, whatever. So what you want to do is just expect those things to happen. They're going to be noises. Sometimes I'm the one making noise while students are taking a test. And I have to remind myself to, uh, to be quiet, OK? So as you're respectful of other people taking the test, then if they aren't or they're making noises they can't help, then just kind of ignore it. Dress in layers. You don't want to be co uh, cold during a test or hot. And layers means I can, I can peel a jacket off, a sweater, whatever, and I can be, get cooler or I can get warmer. Um, choose a seat away from doors and aisles. If you ever are sitting in a place in the room normally, your regular seat that um, is close to someone, you could ask to move. A lot of professors move you anyway, and they have you move out around where there's like a seat between you. That's really good. We're not, we're not talking about cheating. Uh, it's just about distractions, OK? And if, you don't, if you're not asked to move, you might ask if you can move. Um, sit by yourself. One of the things about sitting with others and hearing their dialogue is they're talking about how nervous they are, OK? It's catchy. Oh, did you study? And what do you think that's going to be on the test? And all these tension questions that you, you're relaxed, and all of a sudden now you're not because of someone who is very nervous. You want to be careful not to chat too much about the test with others before. And then you can always just say to yourself something like, I'm going to do well. Breathe. I'm prepared. Remain calm. This is going to be awesome. I will do well on this test. I am so ready. Whatever you say to yourself, it's calming and it's affirming. And one more, your mind goes blank. Anybody's mind just went blank on part of the test. OK. You arrive at the site in plenty of time, not rushing in at the last minute. That would be helpful, wouldn't it? So you're, you have, you've taken care of the, the logistics of getting there and having your pen or pencil, 
putting your materials away, silencing your phone, whatever. If you're hurrying at the last minute, then those things can bring tension. You don't want to have those. Skip difficult questions. If you hit a question that you just totally blank out on, be careful, though, that you don't skip, like, uh, bu bulleting you know, a, a, a particular item on a Scantron, and be sure that you come back to it. If you can write on the test, then you can mark it to make sure you go back and address those questions. Sometimes later, they're not so difficult because you're, you've done everything else and now you've got your full concentration to give to that question and you're not worried about time. That helps a lot. If you go blank on your constructed responses or your essay, this is short answer, then you can always write down anything on scratch paper. They're saying write down anything related to that topic and that sometimes jars your memory and helps you to think about, um, oh yeah, okay, it's coming back to me. And that way you can then transfer that to where you want to put your essay. All right, if I could ask, please, that you, do you know each other? Look around and see if you know each other. Ladies, do you know each other? You're about to get introduced to each other, okay? And gentlemen, do you know each other? Okay, I'm just gonna give you about two minutes, please, to turn to a partner, and I know you can't see the slides anymore, but you've got them down there, and this is about the test anxiety slides. Would you introduce yourself to that partner, kind of scoot over with your chair just for this activity, thank you and discuss one new idea, like I haven't thought about that before, I think I might try it. Or you've been reminded about something that you do, it works, or you'd like to try that you heard about before, okay? So thank you, just about two minutes, share please, each one of you with your partner. Would somebody share what you shared with a partner? Something that was kind of new to you, or sort of a good reminder of what you need to think about or would be helpful, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that might work for you because rather than saying last test I failed or didn't do as well as I wanted to, and but this one I'm better prepared. So you think that's going to help you uh, be able to sort of more successfully show the instructor what you know? Awesome. Somebody else? Something you thought about? Ladies? Uh -huh. And this, this past Monday, I'm showing her that I had three tests and we thought I had two. Three in one day? Yeah, in one oh, day. my goodness. So I had studied for the other one, so obviously I didn't do so high. And I was also telling her that um, I used a study long day session on Sunday, didn't sleep at all. Oh. Stayed up to the, and the easy test I found and the hard test I passed. So <laughs> I was just telling her that, you know, I need to, like, like the way you said, take short little. Study, yeah, study it's the breaks. Your, your brain gets tired. Yeah, yeah. Your brain gets tired, and when it's tired, it's your studying time isn't as effective. And uh, yeah, it just all jumbles together. That's yeah. So what I do is the to-do list. I've got. You can do it on a calendar. You can just. Are, are any of you make lists of sort of here's what I have to do? You might want to do you do it on like folder paper, like notebook paper, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then just you kind of cross through it or check it off as you do it. Yeah. Um, you can do that because otherwise it, there's too much to hold in your head, right? And if you say, I've got Sunday, the day before the test, I'll, I'll just sort of, that's my time to study. And it's like, oh boy. What if you have questions? What are you going to say? It really is. Yeah, it only can. It really can. And so if you have questions or confused about something, you also don't have any resources, the professor or classmates. There's not time really to investigate further where you're confused. Go and find your own seats again. Thank you so much for moving and working with your partner. I appreciate the time that you just gave to that and, and helping us. Understand. This is kind of like what it's like when you study together. You know, we're smarter together because we, we approach things differently. So thank you so much for that. All right, we're going to look at two more uh, items before we go in about uh, 20 minutes, about 15 really. And so I want to make sure that I, I've given you some tips for test taking that are really helpful. Multiple choice testing. When you get the multiple choice item, 
you want to read it very, very carefully. You're going to see in a couple of these that you want to be sure you're answering the question. Now, there's the thing about can I write on the test or can I not write on the test? That makes a big difference, doesn't it? If you can write on it, you can circle things like circle keywords or circle the main thing you're supposed to be doing. In education, teachers are looking at the ways to instruct students, ways to plan, ways to assess what they know. They circle those words on the test to make sure that you're not looking at a term in the test, or excuse me, in the, in, the, in the item, multiple choice, and then you're thinking about, oh, all those things I know about that, and you're looking for something related to that. That one that you pick may not answer that multiple choice question, okay? There's a little bit of truth in that one, but that's not the best answer. Another, think about what is being asked, the situation it's describing, okay? Some people in the test will take notes, the multiple choice, and they will, um, they really take some time, not a long time, to analyze what this question is really asking. Another thing you do, this is so important, if you can't write on the test and literally mark off the letters of those items that you know are wrong, then do it in your head, or take a piece of scratch paper if you can have that at the test, and then just A, B, C, D, you know, number two, A, B, C, D, and cross off the ones that you know aren't correct. What some people do, and you don't want to do this, is they will read the question, and then they'll look for, like, they'll look for an answer when they think they've found it, they'll select it, they'll bubble it, and then they'll move on. You've got to read all the items, right? It could be D. That's better than the one you chose. So if you eliminate those wrong answers, you can really make sure that you are um, finding out what is w one little thing that's wrong about that answer. That's all it takes, even part of the response. And then you want to select the correct answer choice and mark the answer. Again, being careful not to bubble the wrong one. That'll make a big difference. You got it right, but you bubbled it on the wrong number would be something you really regret later. Another uh, set of multiple choice tips is you want to make sure, again, you know what the question is answer, asking. You don't want to look for hidden meanings or tricks. Have you ever just sort of overanalyzed a, a question? You know, you thought too hard about it and kind of talked yourself out of an answer that ended up being the right one because you sort of thought it was going to, it's tricky. Get the trickiness off, off your mind. You want to be sure I've studied this, I know this, I remember what my notes said in the book and the professor, and I, it's not going to be tricky. Um, bubbling answers, we said that already. Make sure that they correspond, especially if you skip. Remember we talked about skipping? And if you skip, you want to mark it to make sure that the next response is by uh, bubbling the right uh, one or marking the right one or going back if you need to. And this is a big one. Do you ever circle the word best or not or accept in that multiple choice item? It, again, either just zero in on it and be sure to notice it if you can't write on the test or put it on the scratch paper. But a lot of people will like best. There's some truth in one of the answers, but there's a whole lot more truth to answer that question in another response. So it's another one would be more correct than the one that you picked most accept and so forth. Not really gets us. You know, that that's, uh, sometimes confuses us. Okay, let's look at, at essay test taking. What you want to do is look at before you take the test, the essay portion, and then during and then after. First of all, you get your booklet or you get your, uh, your paper that you're going to be turning in. Put your name on there. Be sure that you've got your, um, uh, you're going to be, not have to forget about doing that and turn it in without your name, okay? I also tell students on their, if they have their own paper, to number. Put your name on every page and number every page. Notice how many essay items. Sometimes there's one, and then all you're looking at are the different, what are the directions and the different parts of that one item. Sometimes there are several. So you've already found out as much as you could from the professor about what that's going to be like, and you've asked your questions ahead of time before coming. And now you look and read and make really sure if it's multiple essay items, make sure you know what all of them ask you to do, okay? Point distribution. For the ones that have more points, you want to spend more time, right? Because you're going to get more points for it. And also time. How much time? I look at the clock 
And it's okay to be a clock watcher when you're taking tests because you've got to finish, right, before the professor has to walk out the door with your test. So be sure you know you have to do that. It's like you've got something to do at home. My friend's coming by to get me at 5, and I've got an hour to get this done. Test her that way as well. We've got to make sure we finish and we're, we have all the information that we need for that test. And circle words that tell you what to do. Take notes. I mentioned that earlier. It's really, really helpful if you can take notes in the margin of your test. Um, underline words, keywords for the essay as well as the multiple choice. And be sure that you're answering all the questions. Okay? If you have take time to take some notes, some students would say, that will, that'll take too long. Well, it's kind of like pay me now or pay me later. Either take the notes now and not skip part of the answer, or later on you'll regret that you didn't answer all of it. As you write, again, keep managing your time. You're managing it for the planning, and now you're managing it while you're writing. Don't be obsessive about looking at the time, but continue to monitor where am I, how much time do I have left, and how much time do I need to devote for the remaining portions of this question or the remaining essay items. You want to answer all parts of the question. That's why you probably underlined key parts. Some of the materials say to number in the, in the essay directions. Number the items. If that helps, you could do that. And, and then you can look and did I answer one? Did I answer two? Did I address three? That might help. And then refer to your notes. Not notes you brought with you, but notes you made prior to the writing. And then uh, use those supporting details in your answer. So sometimes your head is so full, you knew this concept would be addressed, and it's so full of all the information. If you've had time to just jot down some things on your paper, scratch paper, or the test itself, then you can, you're more likely to put those things in your paper, because you did that jotting. And now you can just concentrate on constructing the essay. Um, use transitions for clarity, like first, second. Your professor needs to be able to read that test. Make sure they can, they can tell um, where your points are, and it makes sense, and it's organized. And then write all that is relevant and no more. You don't want to keep going on and on, right? Because that would be, um, you might, you're, you're wasting time. It wouldn't be necessary um, to, for the grade. It won't help necessarily. Sometimes we think, I'll get a better grade if I just keep writing and writing and writing. It's probably not going to be that helpful, unless it directly relates to what you're being asked to write about. And then finally, after, as you finish writing, you want to always, always proofread what you have written. Um, take the time you need to read over the thing, like just pretend it has a million mistakes in it, okay? And it won't, of course, but you want to catch everything and you want to uh, correct those things. If it's in pen, your teacher wouldn't care if you put a line through it and then um, either added a word or put a new word ahead, on top of a misspelled word or something. So um, it's really important to edit your work. And then you want to recheck the question and your answer to make sure you've answered all the parts. So you finished. You pulled in your notes that you thought either wrote down or you thought about in your head. And then now you're going to see, did I put them in there? And if not, put them in there. Add some things. Your professors know that test essays are drafts. And by that, I mean, and I'm taught English for a long time, and I can say this, that they're not polished. You edited, but you didn't make them perfectly beautiful and revision after revision and then retype it so it's gorgeous and perfect, OK? So we know it's a draft. You want to adhere to things that you were given for instructions like double spaced, like do you have to have an introduction, a conclusion to this essay, the organizational things. And don't you know omit the punctuation and uh, any other errors in uh, grammar, but you don't. We're not expecting it not to have any crossouts or anything that would look like we've been editing our draft because that's all you have to go by. There's not time to copy it over. Okay, usually. We are concluded. You have been an awesome audience, and I hope that you've gained some information that was helpful to you about test anxiety and about multiple choice questions, and also about essay writing. And I wish you all the luck in your future test. <laughs>